Put yourself behind the wheel of a race car. In front of you, the awesome challenge of the Darlington Raceway. You travel 100 miles an hour before you reach the end of pit road. Then, slam into high gear. There are 600 horses under your foot. They can power your 4,000 pound stock car at 180 miles an hour. But you can't run this track at 180 and live. It takes years to learn how hard you dare punch the throttle and the exact moment when bravery turns to stupidity. This is practice. In the race, if you run up front, you'll be fighting three battles. One against the other drivers. Two against the track. Three against your own fear. Lose one of these three battles and you know it. You end up on the sideline, your wife crying, your car wrecked, and wondering whether it's all worth it. You answer that question every Labor Day when they line up to start the Southern 500. Then you realize there's nowhere else in the world you'd rather be. On this battlefield are your friendly enemies. Their names known across the continent. Cale Yarborough, three-time winner of the Southern 500 and three-time stock car racing's national champion. David Pearson, graying hair on the outside and lots of gray matter on the inside have earned him a nickname, the Silver Fox. Buddy Baker, six feet five, a gentle giant, except when he's trying to pass you. Bobby Allison, another three-time winner of this Southern 500. He knows the track inch by inch and uses radio to keep in touch with his pit crew. So does Benny Parsons. And so does the king of stock car racing, Richard Petty. Petty has 85 more victories than any other driver. He has earned $3 million behind the wheel. Today, Petty is nursing ribs injured in a crash two weeks ago. There's a question whether he can go the full 500 miles. Challenging these veterans are young men like Darrell Waltrip, who has led the Southern 500, but never won. This is the 29th Southern 500, the oldest 500 mile stock car race in America. The pace lap is underway. It's a slow lap to warm the engines and tires and to get rid of the butterflies that are part of waiting. Years ago at this track, the fans knocked down fences to watch ordinary passenger cars run for big money. No longer are these ordinary passenger cars. Competition has changed the breed. As cow ponies are different from thoroughbreds, these are different from showroom models. A first-class racing stock car costs $25,000 to build and two or $300,000 to campaign during a year-long season. If you're going to race, you'd better be rich or a winner. 40 cars with a power of 25,000 horses are crowded onto a track that's a mile and a third long. These cars run on bigger and wider tracks, but none tougher. The Darlington track is egg-shaped with a radius of turns one and two different than turns three and four. It's impossible to set up a race car chassis that will work equally well on both ends of the track. Veteran drivers decide on where they'll try to pass and give up performance at the other end. Most drivers agree. I'd rather drive anywhere else, but I'd rather win at Darlington. On the pole, inside front row, David Pearson, number 21, fastest qualifier. Next to Pearson is Darrell Walter at number 88. In the second row, Bobby Allison inside, Benny Parsons outside. Row three, Lenny Pond and Cale Yarbrough. Each car earns its starting position by running two laps against the clock. Faster cars start in front. Now, out of the main straightaway, looking for the green flag and the first of 367 laps. They're racing. 
heading for the first turn with engines roaring like cannon fire. Pearson looks at the wall and keeps his foot down. Waltrip holds second, Bobby Allison is third, Benny Parsons holds fourth. It's Mercury, Chevrolet, Ford, and Chevrolet. The enormous crowd of nearly 75,000 is cheering for favorite car and driver. Off the back stretch and into turn three, with Pearson showing the field the fast way around. Pearson is one of stock car racing's all-time greats. He's fought for 100 victories during his 17-year career. He's won the Rebel 500 on this track six times and won the Southern 500 twice. He's forgotten more about this racetrack than most drivers ever learned. Race cars must be set up differently for every track. Gear ratios, spring ratios, steering controls are all adjustable and it takes a great driver to know exactly what to change and how to change it. The track at Darlington has been completely resurfaced, adding another unknown. Is it faster, more slippery? How will it feel late in the race when there's oil and rubber on it? Dozens of questions fill that part of their mind, not busy with handling a guided missile in traffic at better than 150 miles an hour. There's a car under the wall on the front stretch. That's Ty Scott at the wheel, pointing at the first turn after a short ride backward that must have seemed like forever. Scott keeps it under control and will try to motor around to his pit to see if he can stay in the race. Luckily, Scott kept his car low on the track, away from fast traffic. The yellow flag flies to warn other drivers that cleanup crews are on the track, and the pace car slows everybody down. Pit road is busy as a lover's lane on Saturday night. The veteran racers refuel and change tires. Some drivers ask their mechanics to change the spring settings. With a few turns of a wrench, a car's handling characteristics can be adjusted to track conditions. Then, it's back to the wars. First car on the track will get position one when the green flag flies again. Dave Marcus in number two is on his way, followed by Waltrip in number 88, who slams into Neil Bonnet, and Bonnet's car hooks some television cables stretched across a track. The cables come down across the pit area, but not over the track. No one was hurt as those inch-thick cables tore loose from their supports. Here's what happened in slow motion. Waltrip swung wide to pass Pearson's parked car and hit Neil Bonnet's left front fender. Bonnet's car brushed the wall and a telephone pole. Like a sailfish taking a hook, it roared down pit road with a long line of heavy cable. Bonnet's car shook off the cables, but the damage had been done. Luckily, no injuries from that backlash. They're ready to run again. The green flag signals for high speed, and Dave Pearson is in front of the pack, but he's not leading the race. A long pit stop for four fresh tires has dropped him to sixth position. Two cars behind Pearson is Buddy Baker's number 27 Army Chevrolet, and he's in position one. Right behind Baker's car, Darrell Waltrip has position two but Donnie Allison is passing. Allison passes deep in the third turn, and there's Cale Yarbrough following Allison like a shadow. Allison is second, Yarbrough third, and Walter drops two positions in about four seconds. It's flat out racing now. They found where they can pass and who they can pass. Now it's a question of taking a deep breath and doing it. There's Cale Yarbrough going for second place by diving into turn three with full power. Yarbrough's got second. And here comes Waltrip. It's a game of 150 mile an hour musical chairs. Before the track was resurfaced, passing in turn three was a hair raising piece of work. Now, they make it look easy. After 200 miles, six cars are running nose to tail and everybody's chasing number 27, Buddy Baker, who has a tight grip on position one. There's a challenge from Cale Yarbrough, who is closing on the leader. Baker hammers the throttle of his Army Chevrolet and turns one of the fastest laps ever run on this racetrack, better than 152 miles an hour. But Cale Yarbrough, three-time winner of the Southern 500, fills Baker's rearview mirror. Yarbrough tries to bluff Baker in turn one, but Buddy doesn't back off. 
Yarbrough's got to show a better hand to take the lead as they lap slower cars. Yarbrough's going for the front and gets it. Baker slides as a blast of air from Yarbrough's car slams into him with the force of a tornado. Right behind Baker in position three is Darrell Waldrop's number 88. There's trouble in turn four. A chain reaction of cars out of control. One car's in the fence, another is slammed midships. The yellow flag and yellow signal lights around the track warn all drivers to slow down. Bobby Wawak is out of his car, which backed into the guardrail and slid for 200 feet. Dave Marcus on the left and Ricky Rudd on the right are both safe, although their cars are heavily damaged. Every driver will pass that spot with an unspoken thought. It could just as well be me. Marcus makes it through the heavy traffic that's heading for the pit road. The chain reaction started as Bobby Wawak blew a tire, spun 180 degrees, and knocked Dave Marcus number two out of control. Bawak's car sailed backward at 100 miles an hour for the length of a city block directly in the path of fast cars. It's a miracle someone didn't tear into him. While this was happening, Dave Marcus, broadside to traffic, was hit solidly by Ricky Rudd. Both drivers were shaken, but not injured. The injury to Bobby Wawak goes deeper. He's been seriously hurt in accidents on other tracks, and his wife can't forget. Racing's a great life if you're a winner. The race is restarted, and the Leadfoots are at the head of the pack. In position one, Cale Yarbrough. Right behind him, David Pearson, but Pearson is a full lap behind Yarbrough. Pearson's had two long pit stops. He's trying to make up for lost time, but it's tough getting past a man like Yarbrough. There's still 200 miles to run, and Pearson's won lots of races on the last lap. Pearson tries to unlap himself, but Yarbrough is just too fast. In second position, Buddy Baker's number 27. Darrell Waltrip's number 88 is right behind Baker. There's an invisible path around the track called the Groove. Unlike other super speedways, Darlington is not quite two lanes wide. A driver has just a few seconds on each lap to decide where he wants to pass. Then, punch the throttle and make his move. Dave Pearson tries to unlap himself, but Yarbrough is too strong. Waltrip outbraves Buddy Baker and takes second place. Yarbrough holds a lead of three car lanes. On this track, that's enough. Baker, who led the race earlier, seems to be slowing down. There goes Donnie Allison, a number one passing Baker. Buddy is racing's hard charger. He never slows down unless the car's coming apart under him. Donnie, like Baker, is one of racing's hard luck drivers. He's led a lot more races than he's been able to win. Something seems to go wrong at the worst possible time for Donnie Allison and Buddy Baker. Now, Allison's in third place, less than a straightaway behind Yarbrough's flying Chevrolet. Moving in behind Baker is Donnie Allison's brother, Bobby. Up front, Pearson is still hammering on the door. But Yarbrough keeps it nailed shut. He doesn't want a competitor like Pearson on the same lap. If there's a yellow flag, NASCAR's rules allow everybody to bunch up, and Yarbrough will have Pearson right behind him. Richard Petty is out of his car, using oxygen to clear his head. The seat pushed against his injured ribs on every turn. Buddy Baker's slowing down on pit lane. And there's the end of the road for the Army's hard charger. Engine failure. Yarbrough's riding high, wide, and handsome, cutting through traffic with the confidence of a three-time winner. He knows exactly what that car can do, and, just as important, what it can't do. Yarbrough shows the way to Waltrip, Donnie Allison, and Bobby Allison in that order. All the leaders are flying past slower traffic. Drivers who can't run with the leaders are told to stay down out of the high groove. There's a slow car into the wall, high in the second turn. Look out! Cuckoo!
Michael Marlin rams the wall. Here come the leaders. Dave Pearson and DK Ulrich slam into Grant Adcock's stall car. Other drivers slide all over the racetrack. There on the left is the car that started it all, driven by Grant Adcox. On the right, DK Ulrich sits in junk metal and it's burning. There's Pearson's number 21. The drivers are still in their demolished race cars. If these were ordinary passenger cars without roll bars or safety reinforcements, this might have been a tragedy. NASCAR safety regulations were lifesavers here. The rescue teams report that no driver is seriously injured. Pearson's out of his car, looks at the damage, and knows he's through for the day. Ulrich's car looks like it was run over by a train. Ulrich and Adcox are going to the hospital in the infield. From another viewpoint, here's what happened. Adcox, in number 41, slid along the wall, and then down the track as Cuckoo Marlin came by. Adcox, sideways to traffic, blocked the fast lane. Ulrich slammed into Adcox, and then Pearson also hit him. After a long yellow flag and pit stops by all the leaders, the race is on. Yarbrough still leads, with Bobby Allison in number 15 Ford right on his bumper. Behind Allison is Waltrip's number 88. They're running better than 150 miles an hour, as if they were tied together by a tow rope. It's getting close to showdown time, and Bobby Allison wants to know just how fast Yarbrough can run. Both these men are three-time winners of the Southern 500. There are no four-time winners yet, and the battle that's shaping up right now may decide whether there's going to be one. Door handle to door handle is what they call this kind of racing. This is an amazing show. Two of the fastest cars and drivers on the circuit proving that Darlington really is two lanes wide. It is if you're Bobby Allison and Cale Yarbrough. Each trusts himself and the man in the next car to do the right thing at the right time. If either slides one foot, it's goodbye everybody. Waltrip stays right behind the leaders. This is historic stock car racing and the crowd is going wild. Moving in right behind Waltrip is Donnie Allison. Waltrip bobbles and hits Allison. He's heading for the wall. Allison, stock car racing's hard luck hero, is shaken but not injured. He's led many Southern 500s, but never come home first. He gave the wall a tremendous clout. The leaders, Yarbrough and Bobby Allison, were running like two railroad trains on parallel tracks. But Waltrip, right behind them, slid, dropped down, and bumped Allison. These cars are traveling so fast that the slightest nudge will put them out of control. After the accident, Allison said, Waltrip just turned left. I didn't see any turn signal or anything. He just turned left. Allison did a great job of driving sliding across the track without hitting anybody. Dave Marcus wheels a Petty Chevrolet into the pits, ready to get the car back to Richard Petty. Dale Inman, one of the mainstays of the Petty crew, goes in the window to help Richard readjust the seat belts. Marcus held fourth place while Richard rested his injured ribs. Now, Richard wants to drive the closing laps at Darlington. Allison's car is towed in. The track is clear, and the race is on. 100 laps to go. Yarbrough in number 11 Chevrolet still shows the way. Waltrip, thanks to a fast pit stop, is second. Richard Petty and Bobby Allison are close behind in positions three and four. It's still anybody's race, and all four drivers have a special desire to win. Yarbrough wants to be the first man to win the Southern 500 four times. A victory would also give him a big lead for NASCAR's national championship. Waltrip has won the Rebel 500 on this track, but not the granddaddy of them all, the Southern 500. A victory would add to his national reputation. Richard Petty has switched from his familiar Dodge to a Chevrolet, trying to get back in the winning groove. He's won the Southern 500 only once in his brilliant career. Bobby Allison in fourth spot also has three Southern 500 victories. Like Yarbrough, he wants to be the first man to win four. There goes Waltrip challenging for the lead. 
Yarbrough seems to back off and lets Waltrip go by. Yarbrough may have a lot of reasons for easing off the throttle. He may not want to tangle with Waltrip, remembering what happened to Donnie Allison a few minutes ago. Or he may want to watch Waltrip to see how he handles the tricky Darlington turns. Yarbrough may also be playing a psychological game. If Waltrip goes all out to pass, then is repassed, he might give up the fight. Yarbrough challenges Waltrip and then backs off. Bobby Allison, number 15, one of the four major challengers for the lead, is behind the pit wall and probably finished for the day. The last scheduled pit stops are coming up, and Waltrip is first into the pits. Yarbrough leads, but he too will have to make a pit stop soon. Waltrip's crew starts refueling before the car comes to a full stop. Aircraft type fuel connectors are used to save time. Outside tires are changed to give Waltrip a better bite on the track. With outside tires and enough gas to run the distance, Waltrip rolls out in just under 14 seconds. Waltrip stands on the throttle, leaving the pits. And as he passes Cale Yarbrough's pit, he may have seen Yarbrough's crew with a signboard ready to give him a stop signal. Yarbrough slowing down. He knows that Waltrip's made a 14-second stop. Yarbrough and Junior Johnson, the crew chief for number 11, know exactly how they plan to handle this final critical pit stop. They're gambling, the tires are okay. It looks like one can of gas, no more than 11 gallons, and go for it. Long before the gas can is empty, Kale heads for the door. Yarbrough's car was standing still, only four and three quarter seconds. Yarbrough guns it back out of the track, trying to accelerate without spinning his wheels and wearing away rubber that's already thin. Yarbrough moves into the first turn ahead of Darrell Waltrip. There's Waltrip running flat out. but he's not going to catch Yarbrough on this lap at least. Yarbrough's up to speed and coming onto the main straightaway with a lead that's about a third of a lap, 10 seconds. Waltrip has fresh tires and he's proven that he's as fast or faster than Yarbrough. Can he run Kale down in the few laps that are left? Junior Johnson, mastermind of Yarbrough's crew, stands quietly in the pits with the look of a man who has everything in hand. The radio that connects him to Yarbrough is quiet. There's no need to plan anymore. Just drive it, Cale. Drive it. Yarbrough's doing just that. He's run more than 6,000 competitive miles on this track during his career. He eases off the throttle just a bit, and Waltra picks up a full second. But that's not going to be enough. Unless his car breaks, Yarbrough's got it won. But he's crashed as often as he's won on this track, so Yarbrough's not about to let his mind wander. Petty's car is in the pits, and Dave Marcus is back in the fast chair. Richard's worn out by wrestling it through the turns. Even the padding under his uniform didn't cushion the G-load as the car turned left. Yarbrough is cruising the last two laps. Coming off the backstretch, he'll be looking for the white flag at the finish line. And there it is, signaling one more lap to go. 32 more seconds. Four more left turns to complete 367 laps. Although Waltrip's closed to within five seconds, Yarbrough's going to win this race if he keeps it running another half lap. Yarbrough's winning game plan was simple. Stay out of trouble in the early laps. Race with men you can trust. Give everybody else a lot of room. Make your pit stop a little faster than the next man. And always, use your head. And there's the checkered flag for Cale Yarbrough. It's four hours, 17 minutes since the green flag waved. Cale can coast around now to meet his crew in victory lane. Coasting has never been Cale's style. 13 years ago, Cale was charging for the lead when this racetrack almost chewed him up and spit out the pieces. He was running wheel to wheel with Sam McQuag when suddenly Cale Yarbrough went flying out of this racetrack. As Cale steps from his car in victory lane, 
the first man ever to win the Southern 500 four times, he has to have some memory of that moment. There's nothing as great as coming back from defeat to win the Southern 500. Kale's wife and some of the Arboro children are in victory lane to help celebrate. There's the winner's trophy and a check from Barney Wallace, president of the Darlington Raceway. Kale takes home $30,000 this afternoon. That prize money doesn't have far to travel. The Yarborough clan lives just down the road a piece in Timmonsville, which proudly calls itself the home of Kale Yarborough. Next year, Kale will likely be racing for his fifth victory. And the crowds that seem to grow each year will be back with Kale for the Southern 500. <laughs>